Hi, right, perfect. Well, hello, my name is Harry Kennedy. I'm an electrical engineer and also a technical specialist at Altair. We focus on simulation-based software to help you design your products faster and reduce the amount of challenges you have by simulating earlier in the process. Yeah, so when I'm designing a PCB, the first thing is making sure I have the right parts to actually perform the function. So understanding that if I'm using a main IC, what are my supporting resistors and capacitors look like, or what other supporting devices am I going to be using? And so when actually choosing the right product and choosing the right components, looking at and making sure they can all form and function together, while also reducing things like heat, or making sure that you can actually have proper signals when you're designing and building the traces along with the components themselves. So making sure you have a right component and component selection is gonna help you to guide into the other problems that you're having if you may have problems with the thermal dissipation or the higher speeds of frequencies or even other things as far as being able to actually make your boards that are manufacturable. Um, solder fatigue is really seen a lot in the automotive industries or industries where a high reliability is needed because if you think about it, if a circuit board goes bad in the car, you have lives at risk and there's a lot of risk there. So solder fatigue can happen over thermal cycles, it can happen over the vibrations of the car, and understanding how that can affect your main components is very key. How I look at that process is one, understanding the data sheet of the components I'm using because they are designing with the physical model in sight, um, physical model in sight. So making sure we're using the right packaging when it comes to the parts we use, as well as understanding that there are tools and resources like solder fatigue calculators that you can use. Using the math of how many temperature cycles you may see, what type of vibrations you may see on the PCB, and how that's gonna affect the actual solder joint over time to where you might see where you might see the first failure, but also how that failure propagates through the actual solder ball and what effects that can lead to. The partnership with the manufacturer is always a key thing. Um, before, I talked to a lot of engineers and they say, hey, we don't do checks, we just send it to the manufacturer and let them give us feedback. That process isn't very effective. One, if you have challenges or things that need to be changed, you might have to uproot a lot of your components and redo most of the parts of your board in order to make that happen. Therefore, it's gonna be time and money spent to try to make those changes. Second, is that if your manufacturer tries to build a part over and over again and can't build it, you waste all that time, you create a scrap materials, and hopefully you find that in the manufacturer telling you they can't make it. But I've seen some engineers have a board design and realize during the assembly part, right after they put all the parts on their board, that it's not gonna function because the manufacturer did not create it uh, properly. So really having the idea of one, testing for component spacing, because that's gonna be a understanding of the issues that may happen with some of the copper or uh, solder resist if you have the spacing correct where you can't create the proper solder resist um, onto the board. I would look at that. Also the trace to trace spacing. Again, that etching process can be very tight and if you don't have a proper manufacturer that's sharing with you their details of what they're able to do, you're gonna run into issues of yield. The third thing I would look at is really understanding the board to uh, component to the board edge spacing. As you're trying to um, make these devices more compact, you wanna look into seeing, okay, is there enough space between this through hole component or this connector and the board edge? So that way you don't have damage over time to where you'll see the connector snapping off because that, um, the structural integrity of the board was not kept when manufacturing the board. So um, some DFM checks that we'll incorporate into a design is that we like to check spacing. So again, component to component spacing, component to trace uh, spacing, understanding there are uh, traces to the board itself. But when you think about this as well too, you may have nuanced rules depending on your design. One example is that if you have a high speed section of your board and also you have a high power section of your board, 
they're going to have different tolerances and different spacing requirements that you want to make sure you incorporate into your DFM process. Another example of this is going to be having that you have components on one side of the board but nothing under it. And so this is something that you want to make sure you're checking because there are some components that you don't want anything under it. These are, um, you know, signal that are, the signals are very sensitive and or you have leaded components that you may, or leaded components that you may um, have to put the leads through the board itself. So you want to make sure you have a check that can make sure that you can identify if there's a component on the top layer, no components are around it on the bottom layer. Thermal performance is definitely something that's critical. One is that you're, if you're having a power switching or power converter, you're going to realize that thermal is going to be a key thing to manage while running this board. So first is component type. Making sure you're choosing packaging that is good at dissipating heat. That could mean that you have some packages that have a thermal pad under it, or you can look at the um, amount of area of that thermal pad and, um, in that process. The second thing I would look at is the PCB design itself. So let's say you have a thermal pad on one of your components. You may need to create a technique for the actual copper of the top layer of your board to dissipate that heat a little bit more evenly. So there are techniques and tools called the dog bone aspect of it to where you create a copper um, pour on top and bottom of that thermal pad to create this and allow it to dissipate heat. I would look also into the layers in the stack up itself. So maybe in the top layer you might want to use 2 ounce copper or 1.5 ounce copper instead of the standard 1 ounce copper because it's going to help with dissipating heat. You'll have a trade off with the cost, but at the same time, if your parts are running cool, it can be a value add to your end equipment. Finally, as designers, you want to understand the system that your board is going into. There are some techniques you can use as far as adding heat sinks onto your components that are dissipating a lot of heat and or adding a fan to the solution. So if you have a box enclosure, you may have thought about, hey, we can add a fan in to blow air that might actually help to reduce the overall heat of the, um, of the system itself. So making sure you not only understand your board and the thermal heat there, but what your system requirements are and if you can incorporate things at a system level to help you with the heat problem that you may have. But identifying it early is always the key to the process. So a design review should be collaborative. It shouldn't just be you and your manager or you and the manufacturer checking things off. It should include the key stakeholders of your design. Think of the system engineer that's bringing either multiple PCBs or the enclosure together, making sure they're able to see what your challenges are and what goes into it. Also think about if you have a um, RF or signal integrity expert that approves designs, bringing them in the process and highlighting concerns you may have about those key nets before you design and build it. We've seen time and time again where you have a customer that has an antenna in the device and they add an enclosure on which creates loss in their system and or they didn't design the high speed part correctly and their RF engineer or their uh, subject matter expert can help and provide that insight before and help to reduce those problems later on in the design cycle. Um, finally, I would look at even incorporating that design for manufacturability process or DFM earlier in the design cycle. Again, there are a lot of softwares and tools that can be used to help make these checks. Therefore, you can actually, before you have a design review, run a DFM check, identify what challenges or what concerns there are, and now you're coming into the design review meeting with a list of here are the concerns I have, I need sign off from the key, uh, the key stakeholders such that the whole team agrees on the challenges and understands the risks when moving forward to the manufacturing of the device. One more thing to always think about is that as you're designing boards and boards and boards and getting better at every single one, also think about how you can incorporate some sort of simulation into your design um, process. What that can allow you to do is that if you're in, uh, designing high-speed devices and you usually have to design it, take it to the lab and test it, design it, take it to the lab and test it, Try to incorporate some type of high-speed simulation so that you can try to get an understanding of what the performance will look like before releasing a board. One, this will start to make you a subject matter expert, and two, you're going to help reduce the time to actually create a perfect PCB or intended PCB because now you can tailor this design to certain standards you may have 
and get a better feeling of what it's going to look like and the response is going to look like before you actually have it built. So you'll become more effective in your job and it's something that you can add gradually into the process. Simulate one aspect, the power integrity aspect, then the uh, signal integrity. Then you may try to simulate how the board's going to uh, function over thermal cycles. And once you get better and better at that, you're going to continue to enhance your skill set and become an overall better designer.